since the mid 90s, Command and Conquer and Age of Empires, the real time strategy genre boomed, and every studio wanted a new RTS game in their portfolio. Or more. Like with Rise of Nations, that came out 2003 and was published by Microsoft. Developer Big Huge Games was led by Brian Reynolds, who was the lead designer of Civilization 2 prior, and this is a huge influence on the company's first title, that is Rise of Nations. On the first glance you will see the game looks a little bit different with the relatively small cities that are represented by one building in respect to the people that you move around. One thing that reminds of the Civ series but gives this title a unique look that you have to get along with if you are not used to it. Other things also seem very inspired like the use of research and an enormous tree with a lot of categories that influence very important aspects of the game. You have to recruit scholars in your university to gain knowledge, then use the library to research new technology, one thing that is crucial and if you forget this you will most certainly lose the game. And by the way, nearly every other building has its own tech tree as well. So there are a lot of things on the research side to look after. And this is along the typical stuff like harvesting fields, mining or foresting. But here the game is different as well. Your fields are limited to 5 for each city, other resources are limited as well by the amount of workers for each camp or as a whole of the region you want to harvest. So. In the end, you are much more forced to expand, else your economy will not grow fast enough and building new cities is fundamental, unlike in other real-time strategy games where this is only an option. Of course, there's the fighting as well, infantry, cavalry, artillery, the stuff you all know, but as well there are a lot of differences. Your infantry units produce three men at one time. Entering enemy territory without a supply wagon will cause your troops to lose health over time and the cities are much harder to capture. Their defense is really strong even without troops and when you have thrown the enemy out, there is a time of running and you have to hold it for some minutes or else you will lose it again. Cannons work a little bit differently and are very good for attacking buildings but do not have the same stark effect on troops and you can recruit a general as a special unit that supports troops with his mechanics like invisibility. Towers, forts and certain buildings expand your frontiers and only in the borders of those you can build something. Rushing the enemy with buildings is not possible with all these mechanics. So in the end the main goal is to expand your territory and therefore being able to build more. Another interesting mechanic is that depending on the number you have units get more expensive every time you buy a new one, balancing the game in a way and driving you to expand even more. And of course when someone dies it gets cheaper again. So death is not always a bad thing. Since all those mechanics are going on all at once there is much to do but as well there are so many great comfort functions that should be but out of whatever reason are not standard in many RTS games of today. And this is a big hello to you. <clears throat> Age of Empires 4. Your newly produced workers for example walk to the next potential free working place like collecting wood or food after a time window you can even specify on your own. This frees you from immediate action in your micromanagement. Your scout can be sent to auto explore the map and as well there is not only a working town bell, but the lasso tool prioritizes military units, so you do not have to micro the workers out when a situation gets more stressful.
Rise of Nations was from the start developed as a multiplayer game. At that time, of course, for LAN players more than online gaming, but you can see this very much looking at the campaign mode. There you are playing one famous leader like Alexander the Great or Napoleon on a risk-like map that gives you the vague feeling of doing something there, but in the end you just select the next mission and can sometimes use a card that gives you some bonus like military supply or better economy. In these campaigns you are limited to your time period and the missions differ very much, being overly long or hard with a very pressing timer running and sometimes feeling like a fun mission, just bombing some enemy towers or barracks in 15 minutes. After all, the campaign mode is a little uninspired and, like the rest of the game, not easy to master because of all the micromanagement stuff that is still going on at the same time. Making it hard for a player to see which tech tree to go for next and at the same time attacking the enemy with a time limit or defending yourself against him. So the campaign is there, but the multiplayer is the real star of the game. Against the computer it is not easy to withstand on moderate for all the mentioned reasons, but it really gets a mess when the end game comes and everything changes out of a sudden. Now you have a new resource, that is oil, there are planes, some units are left without an improvement, so you may have once expensive units, but now pointless, nuclear strikes are bombing your cities the match can turn immediately if you get behind in economy or do not know all the details like those nuclear strikes and so on in the end game. The whole thing gets convoluted and you really have to train hard to get all the chains right and fight the enemy in the end. This is often the case in judge games where time periods can move from ancient to information age and musketeers might fight tanks. But because so many things change, the game itself feels less coherent and requires the player to train different periods of time and therefore gameplay, or limit it to a certain age. Of course, this is different in a normal game versus friends cause everyone has only two hands, but still there is a gap, at least when it comes to modern ages, where you suddenly have to build anti-plane weapons and everything changes so hard. So this kind of end game phase breaks the game more or less into maybe two phases and you have to train for each separately. In the end, Rise of Nations is in any case a unique game. It looks unique, it feels unique and out of all the detailed work put in it, is one of the most interesting of all the real time strategy games that go through those many ages. And therefore with Rise of Nations it takes much more time to learn the basic gameplay, but the mechanics are well made and every now and then I give it a try.